Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my absolute privilege and pleasure to welcome at the Democracy Institute, Professor Gladden Papin, who normally is a professor of politics at the University of Dallas, but this year he is a senior fellow at uh, in Budapest at the Matthias Corvinus College. And we know each other through a research project which has been in the making for, for quite a, a while. The, the project itself is the British Handbook of Illiberalism, to which he very, very kindly agreed to, to contribute a, a chapter on, on Christianity. And it was through the conversation that, that led to the, to the chapter that I, I thought that it would be a really excellent thing to, to have you here at, at CEU. Um, you are recognized as, as one of the intellectual leaders of a conservative revival in American intellectual circles, uh, hailed by editorials as a voice for post-Trump republicanism, which should be intriguing for, for anyone uh, in our circles at CEU and also of the Democracy Institute's broader circles. In many, in one of your many uh, public roles, you you do you did co-found and co-edit the American Affairs Quarterly, which is a which is a brilliant publication, and I'm really proud to have a physical copy uh, because I I know this as an online publication that engages in contemporary debate. So it's it's an absolute pleasure to to have you at CEO Bedham. And let me turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Renata. It's a great pleasure to be here and thank you for taking the time to come on this uh, Thursday evening uh, to our discussion. So um, I am very, very grateful for uh, the invitation to come here. Um, as well as to the invitation uh, to contribute to Renata's excellent uh, handbook on illiberalism. And as she said, the, the conversations that we had <clears throat> uh, in working on my contribution for that um, ultimately led here. So I'm very glad to be here. Um, I'm going to speak today as uh, something of a mix between a political scientist and a, and a political theorist. Um, I'm going to try to describe what I think are some of the trends that are causing change in the post-Trump Republican right, the American right after Trump or the post-Trump Republican Party. Um, this is not an attempt to describe um, the complete state of the Republican Party. Um, I'm just going to try to capture what I think are some of the elements that are driving change um, and that, you know, together, depending on how they cash out or how they develop, um, will put a kind of stamp on the Republican Party in the years to come. Um, and at the end, I'll be a little bit agnostic about, um, you know, where that will, where that will end up. I'll try simply to describe, um, what I see as some of the, the tendencies and I give a kind of framework for analysis and discussion. So I hope that that's useful. Um, and I'll be very happy to discuss any bit of that, um, afterward. So I want to focus on um, three particular areas that political change uh, typically occurs um, in politics generally um, and in American politics today specifically. Again, this is also not um, a comprehensive view of political change, but these are three areas where important political changes um, are happening on the right. Um, and I would call these the inside, the outside, um, and the in-between. So uh, inside politics, um, you know, what are the marginal shifts or the shifts at the margin that are occurring among political actors on the right? Like what are, what are um, so politicians who are thinking a little bit differently in the post-Trump era, what are they thinking about? Not what does the whole Republican Party think? What is its fixed thing? But how, where is the direction of change? What are, what are, what are the elements that are moving um, my, my, my view or my inclination is that, you know, those elements of change tend to be the ones, um, that can put a new stamp on something, right? Like you had the whole Republican party and then you had the radical figure of Trump come in. Um, so that was a kind of change 
at the margin, which led to a, a reconfiguration in the rest of the party. So that's the, that's the framework that I'm using to evaluate this. Um, so I want to take a look at or have in mind um, potential elements of political changes or shifts among elite actors, political actors, um, you know, analysts in Washington, uh, staffers, um, you know, senators and you know, governors and other major uh, American political figures. Changes on the outside, that would be you know, changes in the, in the voter base as a whole, changes in the constituencies that are voting for the Republican Party on the right. How does, how does, how does, how does the shift in constituencies, the shift in types of people who are voting um, for the Republican Party, what effect will that have um, on the right uh, in America going forward, or what could the effects be? Um, and then finally, the in-between. Um, I think most you know, day-to-day uh, political noise or noise that you hear around politics falls in this category. Um, you know, campaign slogans, you know, movements, uh, big conferences, rallies, media messages, things like that. That's all the kind of in-between noise which um, kind of occupies the space between you know, voters and those who are actually shaping policy or uh, leading um, politics on the inside. So I just wanted those are that's kind of how I look at it. Um, and how I'd like to uh, think about it just as a framework for discussion. Um, I thought I would begin also by uh, mentioning a few permanent changes that occurred from the Trump years. Obviously, um, I'm trying here to identify a few things that I think have changed substantially separate from the personality of Trump. We can talk all day about, you know, the long-term consequences for American democracy of what um, you know, Trump did in December of 2020 and January of 2021. I'm trying to kind of set that aside and say, you know, with, with the noise aside, you know, what were some permanent changes that were wrought by um, Trump's presidency? The first, I think, is that GOP voters um, more commonly now take an anti-corporate stance. They feel cultural hostility between themselves um, and big corporations. This is a big shift from say, the typical character of the Republican Party 30 years ago, um, which was focused on, you know, even at the even at the popular level, focused on kind of rhetorical defense of uh, free markets, you know, pushing for lower corporate tax rates um, and, and, ge- and in general having um, kind of attitude among on the American right um, that corporations can do no wrong and are wrongly vilified by the left. That's kind of changed as the cultural character of the major American corporations has changed too. We can come back and and, um, talk about why that has changed, but I think it's a, I think it's a fact. Um, My sense is that that impulse hasn't fully worked itself out um, among GOP voters and you know GOP policymakers, but there's a strong sense of it um, among you know ordinary. you know, Republican voters or conservatives in the United States. The biggest corporations are you know, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, uh, Google. Those are the, you know, the, the big corporations that are kind of um, in your face all the time or you know, providing services to you all the time that you're constantly interfacing with. Um, and particularly when it comes to you know, cultural issues, um, I think a lot of, of more conservative voters have started to feel that those uh, corporations are hostile to their interests or even acting against them, um, so I think that's a that's a that's something that changed really during the the Trump presidency. That's a kind of permanent effect of that that populist uh, moment. Um, there's also a lot of increased attention to trade policy in Washington. Um, you know, during the during the Trump administration, this I think was one of the substantive things that started to happen behind the scenes as um, you know, policymakers and administrators started to think in particular um, about uh, what kind of measures could be uh, introduced to um, you know, defend what remains of American manufacturing against China or get a, get a better bargain for America in international trade, um, or even now to secure um, elements of um, the manufacturing supply chain. So during the coronavirus, beginning of the coronavirus epidemic, it was clear all of a sudden to ordinary Americans, hey, we're not able to produce masks in our country. Um, how, why is that the case? Why, why, do, why do we have only the design and not the manufacturing element of um, pharmaceutical supply chains? All of those are areas where 
Um, even though Trump was kind of a personal wrecking ball at the high level, um, the, the ground shifted in the, in the policy space. And a lot of that is carried over to the Biden administration, too. That's what I mean by a substantive shift. Um, also, you know, a higher level of overall politicization. Uh, I don't want to dwell on that too much, but um, certainly the United States right now, it feels that everything is political um, or that people are taking positions, for example, on um, you know, vaccines, vaccine mandates and things like that um, on, a, on a political basis. Um, so there's a, there's, a, there's a general sense, I think, um, that there's a kind of politicization or polarization in the air, even around things that should theoretically be scientific, for example. Um, and we can, you know, discuss where that came from and, and what it means. But again, I think it's just descriptively a kind of, uh, you know, for now, a permanent change uh, left by the Trump era. Um, and last but not least, the defeat of interventionist and, and neoconservative foreign policy. Um, a lot of the neoconservatives who were um, most strongly in favor of U.S. intervention abroad basically left the Republican Party. Um, and either became sort of overt members of the um, kind of interventionist wing of the Democratic Party or kind of left for another world uh, between the two parties, which, you know, continue to advocate for this more um, robust uh, foreign policy interventionist stance. Um, but that's changed fundamentally, I think, um, within the Republican Party. We'll see how it works itself out over time, particularly uh, with regard to China. Um, but that was one thing that, um, again, for all the noise in the air, you know, fundamentally changed with Trump. <clears throat> At the same time, a lot of new issues have emerged on the American right um, that weren't there before the Trump administration as well. Um, these are these are all things that I also have a kind of personal interest in. We've pushed, um, you know, published that is a lot of articles on them um, in our journal American Affairs. Um, and again, there are things that the, um, the Trump era of populism led to kind of policy level reconsideration of some of these issues. So um, first, and I'll, co I'll come back and give a couple of, of examples of these uh, later in the talk, but how to respond to a stronger China, not only militarily, but through industrial policy. Um, so the title I gave to the talk was, you know, New Right Meets Old Left, The Strange Bedfellows of Post-Trump America. Um, I think that's something to keep an eye on. Um, industrial policy um, hasn't really been a, a topic on, on the American right, maybe since the Cold War, when the military, American military industrial complex was kind of the you know, most obvious element of an industrial policy. Um, but in the intervening years, in the 90s and in the early 2000s, um, it was really the old labor left that kept alive uh, the notion that, um, you know, national policy should be oriented um, toward building up, um, protect, building up American industry, protecting American industry, um, and thereby protecting American workers. Um, during the 90s, that kind of, um, kind of went out the door, I guess. Um, and you could say that we pursued a different type of industrial policy, an industrial policy oriented toward you know, shifting America in the direction of being a, a service sector economy, uh, and an information and computer technology, uh, and, and ultimately, in the end, software economy, um, so software and services. Um, so this, you know, I think what happened after 2016 is that, you know, the, the debates, again, at the margin started to shift from, you know, are you in favor of, are you in favor of the free market, or are you in favor of socialism, or are you in favor of, um, you know, national minimum wage, or... Uh, you know, letting states set economic policy, how they, like all those, those categories seem to have less, less purchase um, on the phenomena that were starting to drive political change. Um, and so from that standpoint, you started to see um, this discussion of industrial policy come back. Um, and again, I'll give some examples of this specifically toward the end of the talk, um, but from political figures on the right, um, in some cases, aligning with um, maybe not big sectors of the um, maybe not palpable political sectors of the left, but with left-wing um, intellectuals and economists in particular. Um, you know, second new issue on the American right is um, how to support the family through uh, policy. 
um, you know the you know one way one way of describing critically what the Republican Party did um, in the 1990s and 2000s was basically was basically that it pursued um, a pro corporate economic policy, an interventionist foreign policy, and a sort of rhetorical policy of being opposed to abortion um, and making making um, conservative cultural issues a kind of campaign rallying cry. Um, but there's been more discussion in the last few years um, about, you know, what about the fact that the Republicans never have a kind of substantive, um, you know, policy agenda around that, except at the except at the rhetorical level? What would it mean um, if Republicans win, um, you know, or even achieve some victories in their um, uh, in their in their cultural culture war? Uh, what would it mean for them to offer a public policy that's directly supportive of families? Is that something that the Republican Party could do? The Republican Party has always been hostile to state spending programs. You know, in the nine, 1990s, it was advertising itself as um, you know the agent for uh, you know reducing the welfare state, um, you know lowering taxes, things like that. Um, so the notion of like what to the notion of what to do with governing power is something that the Republicans often struggled um, to uh, answer or to substantiate. Um, and then finally, how to mount conservative challenges to big tech. Um, you know, this has become, I think, um, the, the other side of the new uh, conservative skepticism about uh, big corporations. I and mean, the, the biggest corporations are the ones that are, um, from, the standpoint of, from the standpoint of ordinary Republican voters, um, more culturally hostile to them. There's a kind of potential for an alliance between um, conservatives who were skeptical of the role uh, that big tech is playing in American political and cultural life um, and old, uh, you know, an older left-wing tradition, um, which is skeptical of large corporations uh, and monopolies on other grounds. So those are, those are some elements of, um, I think, what's permanently changed in the post-Trump uh, America and how those issues are starting to appear on the American right. Um, so, you know, where, where does this lead? Um, you know, where would these, where are these directions potentially going? Um, here I'm going to shift from giving a definitive answer to um, charting a couple of paths um, you can decide which one is more likely than the other, than the other but charting a couple of paths um, that are possible ways that the Republican Party could respond to these uh, challenges and shifts. Very likely it will end up being bits of both, but for the time being, I think we can divide these um, potential responses uh, into two tracks. So one is through the rebranding of earlier GOP policies under the MAGA label, <laughs> the Make America Great Again label. Um, I think this has happened in a lot of ways already. Um, you know, if Trump did nothing else, he made this kind of um, crude populism popular, right? I mean, he did have these huge rallies of, you know, 50 or 60,000 people all during the campaign. It was much more popular as a um, you know, on the ground retail national politician than, you know, any previous um, Republican uh, contender since Reagan, probably. Um, so he had, a, he had a palpable energy, which can't be denied, um, that caused a lot of people to flock to him. Um, but I think you can make a, you can make a division between, um, you know, a, a couple of directions that that crude populism can go. Um, obviously, for Trump, a, a, you know, a major element of his uh, populist rhetoric was uh, opposition to immigration, you know, build the wall, obviously, being the famous campaign slogan. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of a lot of people who uh, were already in the Republican Party and maybe had been standard standard Republicans um, before. Um, I just a little bit. Um, sorry, knocked over my own water. Um, just a second. Um, sorry about that. 
Um, I think we're okay, so I'll continue. Um, sorry. There we go. All right. My apologies. Um, you know, one, the, this first model um, of, you know, responding to the, responding to or developing the post-Trump um, American right is basically that the energy of Trumpism uh, is just distilled into more hardened opposition to mass immigration. That's what the Make America Great Again slogan becomes. Um, you know, you can attach other kind of negative uh, cultural judgments to that if you want. You know, that, the, that um, you know, a, a, a Republican candidate who, you know, distills the post-Trump moment into deeper opposition to immigration um, may be likely to lose uh, Hispanic voters that have started to come over to the Republican Party, um, may you know, result in, uh, again, trafficking in um, uh, sort of caricatures of um, hostility, to, um, uh, hostility to immigrants. Um, a couple of other features, I think, that uh, describe this um, you know, rebranding of earlier GOP policies um, under the new MAGA anger is a kind of retreat from the rest of American society. Um, you know, you've already started to see that the response to um, uh, what was perceived as big techs becoming uh, left wing is just that American conservatives or, you know, right wing figures are just building alternative media networks. Uh, Trump now has a media network. You know, there was Parler, which was supposed to be like a right wing uh, alternative to Twitter, things like that. Uh, those are those are more activities of retreat um, and, uh, you know, the formation of a kind of redoubt rather than trying to transform the message into one that could appeal to a large electorate. You know, the, Im the impulse there is, um, you know, everything's gone horribly wrong um, and, uh, you know, little is little. Uh, you know, there's no longer a fair public playing field. It's dominated by hostile uh, left-wing actors. Therefore, we're just going to come up with a right-wing version of the same thing, and you know, do that and do that in the southern states. We're going to have you know conservative business networks, um, and we're just more or less going to retreat. That's not a vision for um, you know becoming a a party that could appeal to a national majority or really win an election at all. Um, it's a more basically a more reactionary impulse. So that's a strong impulse in the post um, 2020 uh, Republican Party, you know, particularly among um, ordinary voters who feel on some level that the election was taken from them. I'm not talking about this at a you know granular level, but um, you know feel that uh, the media environment was unfair. That there was like a permanent war to remove Trump. Um, that you know they as ordinary Republican voters are being blamed for the incidents of January 6th. That sort of, all of that um, kind of sentiment pours into just retreat and reaction. Um, and it's entirely possible that that will, um, you know, be a major driver of Republican politics in the years to come. Another element of that would be, um, again, sort of reactionary opposition um, to elements of the left-wing cultural agenda, if you will, um, in American education to the presence of uh, uh, critical race theory and things like that. Um, basically, this is the, the, react, the reactive reactionary option. Um, you know, in politics, that's, a, that's an easy way to go. I mean, it's a, it's a natural impulse. Um, for political entrepreneurs, it's easy to capitalize on. Um, for, you know, entrepreneurial conservative um, you know, media figures, it's also something easy to capitalize on because there's tons of money in American politics. So you know, to make a good amount of money, like branding yourself as the, the uh, person who can give voice to, you know, the, the downtrodden or whatever from this, from this point of view. Um, but is it politically productive? Does it match the, does it match the potential trends that are still going um, in, in this direction? Um, meanwhile, all this, the scenario would be all this stuff happens at kind of the level of retail politics 
um, you know, at the level of the conservative movement at the in-between level, but on the inside level, um, you know, the more corporate oriented donor class continues to orient actual policy around just lowering taxes and protecting their wealth. You know, that scenario, that's why I think of that scenario as one in which, you know, from a policy standpoint, it's basically an earlier version of the Republican Party that's just focused on lowering, keeping corporate taxes low, um, and uh, has maybe uh, maybe a, an uglier rhetoric than it did 20 years ago. That's one possibility. Maybe the likelier one. Um, but I think there is another possibility, you know, which we can put back under the, you know, strange bedfellows of post-Trump America um, category, and that's new right meets old left. Um, you know, the elements of this scenario, again, it's not, it's not a scenario that has to dominate the Republican Party. It's just a trend that has to affect politics at the margin, just has to affect a few players. Um, this would be a scenario in which the right recognizes uh, the opportunity that these trends represent to it. I mean, I'm neutral on whether, um, you know, which way, which side political trends can uh, help. Um, you know, Michael Lind, who writes a lot for American Affairs, had two essays um, in the magazine Tablet a couple months ago. One of them was called How the Republicans Can Build a National Majority Party. And the other was called How the Democrats Can Build a National Majority Party. You know, the idea being that both that the elements of a kind of stable majority um, involve combining, you know, combining uh you know, natural tendencies on the left and right with what's known to be a, you know, a popular potential base for a national party. Um, so this doesn't just have to be the right, but I'm giving you that scenario. So the right recognizes an opportunity um, to put the family back at the heart of public spending programs. Um, large government spending programs are popular on some level. Of course, a lot depends on how you pull them. But if you talk about taking away people's benefits, taking away people's social security or Medicare, um, which Trump never threatened to do. In fact, quite the contrary, when he was, you know, on, on the campaign trail in 2016, um, you know, he sounded very much like a kind of big government, um, if you will, proponent of those uh, social safety net programs. But maybe the, maybe the thing for the Republican Party to do is to try to um, you know, link those social safety net programs with the cultural values that the Republican Party claims to support, like orienting more of them around um, uh, promoting family life, something like that. Um, so in place of anti-government rhetoric, which has always been popular on the right, um, but not popular among the voter base at large, uh, Republicans could orient the state toward promoting national investment. Um, and then finally, there's also the question of what happens to the um, you know, elements of um, uh, working class discontent. Um, you know, Trump attracted a, a large number of working class voters um, who, you know, didn't hold traditional um, Republican limited government um, policy preferences, but instead, um, you know, wanted kind of robust support uh, from the state. Well, there's growing labor discontent in America for all sorts of reasons. Um, that's true maybe um, in, in parts of Europe as well. Um, you know, a, uh, a, a truck driver was elected to the New Jersey State Senate um, because he just basically registered as a, a candidate. And I think he spent a total of like $153 on his campaign or something like that. And, you know, got, elect got elected to the New Jersey Senate. So, um, you know, if stuff like that is happening, you know, what's the Republican response to that going to be? Is it, is it, we're the party of small business owners, um, and the corporate class, or is it, we have a place for, um, disgruntled, uh, truck drivers who are socially conservative, but maybe voted for, for the democratic party in the past for all sorts of reasons. Um, do we have a place for them? So those are two, um, two, I think broad directions that the post-Trump uh, Republican right could go. So, you know, are there shifts in this second direction? Are there shifts in the, um, you know, new right meets old left uh, direction? Well, I promised you a couple examples of um, Republican interest in industrial policy. This is um, an essay by Josh Hawley, the Republican senator 
from uh, Missouri in the New York Times on October 29th. Um, the title is The Only Way to Solve Our Supply Chain Crisis is to Rethink Trade. So this would be an example of um, you know, a change at the margin. There are several, um, several senators who've you know, taken a particular interest in developing this um, you know, Republican argument for um, bringing back elements of American manufacturing, not in the Trump way, where he just went on the campaign trail and said, we're going to bring back all the jobs, you know, not, not like that, um, but in a more sophisticated way. For example, um, setting standards in, in government procurement that require a certain percentage of goods um, or parts to be manufactured in the U.S. Like a, a, that's like an administrative change or a policy change, which is connected to this, um, this movement. So um, you've started to see some, I guess you would call it policy entrepreneurship or something. Um, and I think you'll see more. Similarly, uh, movement in conservative opposition to big tech. Um, earlier in the year, uh, Governor Ron DeSantis of Florida, who's obviously a, a potential contender um, in the next presidential election or is widely thought to be a, a potential contender, um, signed a bill, no real strong enforcement mechanism, but um, signed a bill to uh, stop what he described as the censorship of Floridians by big tech. So, you know, again, we're mostly at the stage of saber rattling rhetorically here, um, but you're starting to see a lot more of it, um, a lot more saber rattling by um, Republican politicians, you know, hauling, um, you know, Mark Zuckerberg and, uh, you know, other Silicon Valley executives before uh, congressional committees and, um, you know, throwing, again, it's mostly just rhetorical, but throwing pointed questions to them um, about political censor censorship on their um, platforms. Similarly, are there different dynamics emerging around family policy? Um, and mostly has not been a, a thing in the United States. Um, we have a, a small you know, child tax credit at the national level, but otherwise, um, among you know, major developed economies, we have one of the lowest elements of family benefit public spending in the world. Um, again, among the developed um, you know, OECD economies. So um, for a trial period beginning uh, at the beginning of his administration, President Biden um, took our, our child tax benefit tax credit, which is usually something that um, financially savvy people are aware of when they do their taxes, and he transformed it into a monthly check that you receive in your hands so that you know that you're receiving your you know, child tax benefit um, in a way that's like a conservative policy. It's something, you know, it, Republicans have always, um, you know, claimed to be pro-family. And here's the Democratic president, you know, trying to make that benefit, um, you know, more direct, larger, more accessible. Um so maybe that's an element where the previous Republican, um, not coalition, but the, the previous Republican way of thinking about things was, um, you know, in practice, we're, we're just going to um, you know, be in favor of reducing regulation or reducing taxes um, and not going to kind of try to direct the public resources of the state toward the support of families. Um, so there have been some shifts in that direction, at least a lot of policy discussion um, which I've been a part of as well, um, but with a lot of different proposals uh, made by um, you know, political people on the right uh, for what a uh, federal, federally supportive you know, uh, family benefit policy uh, would look like. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your perspective, um, the fact that President Biden kind of you know, made this his issue changed the dynamics of that on the right. Um, since the right is opposed to whatever Biden's doing. So, you know, it kind of changed the dynamics there. Um, so, but fundamentally, um, and just to get back to uh, our original framework and, and conclude here, um, how might political change play out on the right? Um, and I talked about analyzing this uh, from the inside 
or, you know, talking about political actors on the inside, um, you know, voters on the outside, and then the, uh, the world of campaigning, uh, sloganeering and movements uh, in between those two. Um, and so I would just suggest, you know, how might this play out on the right? Um, you know, a lot of the Republican Party leadership isn't going to change substantially. Um, you know, the donor class is still effectively uh, there and projecting its influence um, through all sorts of think tanks on the right uh, in Washington, many of which are very hostile um, to what would be, you know, option two, I guess, the new elements of the um, potentially potentially more statist uh, Republican policy, I guess. Um, so while much of the Republican Party leadership <laughs> remains static, um, the dynamic portion, again, I think that's where the change is occurring, the dynamic portion uh, is moving more in this um, post-Trumpian uh, direction. And you see that um, like all of the new think tanks in D.C. Are, are headed in this direction. There are a lot of new outfits, new, uh, in many cases, you know, um, uh, small but um, small but very energetic uh, groups of people in Washington are, are oriented on, on that line. So it, it feels like that's where a lot of the energy is, even if the static character of the rest of the Republican Party and the kind of um, the temptation of uh, using Trump's rhetoric all over again may be too much to resist for a lot of politicians. On the outside, um, among the electorates, among the electorate, um, uh, Blacks, Hispanics, and uh, Asian Americans drifted right in recent elections. So, um, you know, what's the GOP going to do about that? Is it going to stick with its static, um, you know, cultural posturing, you know, effectively policy is oriented around uh, supporting big corporations and lowering taxes. No, that's not really going, that's going to be appealing maybe to um, Hispanic small business owners in Florida or something like that. Um, but maybe not to, you know, working class Hispanic voters in, uh, in parts of Texas where they're uh, dependent upon the, the social safety net, but are fundamentally socially conservative. So what, what effect will that um, have in the Republican Party, or will the Republican Party try to do something for and, and harness um, some of the drift toward it? Because it's a reconfiguration of its constituency, potentially. Um, and then finally, um, you know, general left-wing uh, cultural overreach um, will inspire reactions, just like, um, you know, look at what happened in the Virginia gubernatorial election a couple days ago that basically boiled down to, um, you know, parents being angry over um, what they saw as the presence of a, a sort of extreme version of anti-racist education in, in schools, I guess, critical race theory, they call it. Um, so anyway, the details don't really matter, but there will always be you know, political excesses on one side or the other and a reaction. So what will that lead to? Will it just be, um, will the politicians that, um, you know, give voice to the reaction just kind of, you know, bloviate like, or, or, you know, spew words like the late stage Trump? Um, or will they, upon getting into office, be able to offer a coherent agenda of some sort? Um, obviously, time will tell. Um, I think it would be better for better for everyone if option two you know, were likely to prevail. I don't think um, it would be good for uh, the Republican Party, America, or the world to have just another version of um, late stage Trump. Certainly, I think everyone can agree on that. Um, so, if I can end there, um, sorry I went uh, much longer than I had originally planned. Um, but thanks for listening and happy to take questions and discuss. Thank you very much. Uh, did, you, did you like sit down at the table or just stand? Yes, um, that's, at the, at the I'll probably just stand, but uh, unless you look like, uh, sure. What do you prefer, really? In the, to, to preserve the health of, of, yes. of, 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 of 
of electronics. That's right. That's right. Water and electronics don't mix, so. Uh, there is definitely no no nice nice man. So let me let me see if there are if there are questions in in the room. Yes, Clara. Um, I want to ask you about the about the recently concluded election. So, Rostad is saying that that Democrats need to find a new way to talk about race and education. So if you who, were who was saying Rostad? Yes. And um, so if you were speaking to the Democrats and advising them about a vocabulary to talk about CRT, what would you tell them? Um, that's a good question um, to which I've given very little thought. What would I say to, um, you know, uh, look, the, the, from an educational standpoint, um, the story that was, you know, told in American schools in the 1950s was obviously odious in, in many ways. Um, you know, I had a kind of traditional if you will, uh, education in the U S. Um, and I think the only thing I learned about was the English, you know, um, that, uh, you know, one fine day the pilgrims came over and, you know, planted glorious seeds in new England and, you know, had Thanksgiving, whatever, you know, it was, it was a highly distorted, um, thing. Even for me, I'm a citizen of an Indian tribe, um, you know, from, a Kind of French and Indian background, um, so the picture there was, you know, extremely distorted. Um, and unfortunately, like w one way or another, we ha we have to come to some, you know, middle ground between, you know, the al the alternatives and ed and education shouldn't be um, that uh, you know the pilgrims sailed the ocean and you know uh, found an empty continent, uh, you know, with no Indians except for very friendly ones. Um, and then, you know, built a glorious society on the one hand, um, or, you know, everyone alive today is so deeply marred by, um, their participation in a, uh, you know, racist system that we can't even have a, a conversation about anything together. I don't know. Some like the s schooling shouldn't consist of two such extreme options. Um, and, uh, hopefully, you know, I guess the, the the good potential outcome w would be that you know our national story winds up somewhere between those two um but at the moment it's kind of spiraling out of control and in, in both directions um and i i think i would i think i would say that um you know the, as with any extreme like the backlash is not going to be a good one um and so you know, if we if we if we drive the conversation in the in the direction of I don't know what an extreme version of uh, critical race theory would be, then you know the alternative is going to be some people claiming you know just kind of re uh, returning to the equally uh, ridiculous or even more ridiculous um, you know story in which um, you know the English were the only people who built America and that's where we are. So. You know, I don't know. I would encourage both sides to think more politically about, you know, what's likely to to result. Um, crusades in education don't usually work. <laughs> um, and because America has, a, you know, a fairly decentralized education system, um, particularly in the post-coronavirus era, more people are just going to opt out. So, um, you know, there's a large, um, you know, there are infinite options in in private schooling, basically. So, you know, people can move. So we're just going to end up with like even less of a national story such as it is. But it's a good question. And I'm pretty pleased I didn't have to ask the education question. I was <laughs> listening with both, uh, both uh, and 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 here to, to American developments. And, as inspiring, so you tell a very inspiring story about a potential future where, where divisions are are healed, and where the Republican Party understands that it ba its base has has moved and it's less white when when, when you look at 
disorders. At the same time, you, you do have serious efforts to disenfranchise non-white Americans uh, by the Republican Party with, with every redistricting effort, uh, effort like with, with the Texas map, it just created a, a very white little enclave to, to make sure. So, so there are structural, so I, I, I'm wondering the, the extent to which some of the dynamics that are preserving the status quo of, of the old elite, which is very white, and the donor class that benefits them are going to work against finding even space for, for conversation. And I'm partly interested in your take on, on the dynamics with, with electoral design and also with the courts, and especially the Supreme Court, that has a strong Trump era impact that is going to last if the justices are in good health for, for quite a, a while. So I, I'd really like you to, to reflect uh, to the extent possible about the forces that preserve the status quo and how those mediate against the, the much more positive and, and, and hopeful picture which, which, which you presented. I mean, people have to win elections, ultimately. Um, so I think the, you know, if we call the uh, the negative picture you offer in which the Republican Party tries to remain a, you know, party of the rich, white, you know, middle and upper classes, it's going to lose badly or continue to lose, um, you know, uh, suburban whites were basically the segment of the electorate that, um, swung in the direction of Biden in 2020. Um, but I, again, I think, uh, I mean, probably the element of that, that is, I guess the greatest, uh, black, black pill, if you will, the, the greatest sign that, you know, nothing will change um, is that the, you know, much of the static energy of the political inside, um, you know, is still supported by the same donor class, as you said. Um, but I think on the ground, you know, um, people want to win elections and political entrepreneurs will have to think about how to do that. So a, a Texas Republican Party that, uh, you know, continues to try to appeal only to conservative white voters and is going to lose. <laughs> I mean, it won't, will not be able to, you know, be competitive in the, in the Texas of the future. And, um, you know, without getting into the details of it, there's only so much, uh, there are only so many electoral tricks that uh, either side could pull to, you know, keep uh, democratic forces at bay. There's only so much redistricting that one could do if one were doing it that would maintain a, maintain a, a, um, a particular political configuration amid such a great shift. So uh, sooner or later that, version of the Republican Party is just not going to be successful. Um, so I think in a, I think in a democratic system, you have to, um, you know, put the, the faith element of your political calculus and some, um, some effect of, of electoral demands over time. Um, so as, um, you know, as, new constituencies start to enter the Republican Party or maybe flirt with it, um, their demands will, you know, be voiced by sort of political entrepreneurs who are, um, who seek local or state level offices uh, or even gubernatorial positions based on that new configuration. Um, the end result of this may just be a dysfunctional Republican Party, maybe a Republican Party that, um, uh, where, uh, you know, uh, a decision is 
kind of made to um, appeal to um, whatever whatever the political issues of the of the day, critical race theory or something like that. Um, and then at the moment of formulating policies, everything's already uh, you know written and drafted by the the same donor supported. Uh, in effect, in effect, like right wing neoliberal elite, that's entirely possible that that just leads to a dysfunctional Republican Party. But um, so, I'm not sure that that's a satisfactory answer. But um, but I think that I think you know political forces are strong over time in a democracy. So um, you know, I think the I think the picture you paint is of a Republican Party that won't be able to win elections. I wasn't painting the picture. You've, no, no, no. You've, 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 you've well, the, the one that you yeah. put back, the, the possibility that you put for, for consideration. And it sounds as if so, following your argument to, to its conclusion, it sounds as if the Republican Party is disenfranchising its own self and its own potential voters in, in with, with the electoral engineering strategies that are currently being followed, which I find curious uh, as a potential conclusion from, from the picture you presented. Um, yeah, I mean, I, right. Well, both parties, both parties are potentially in the process of, you know, losing. <laughs> um, you know, the Democratic Party has gone culturally way too far to the left for the average American voter. That's why they're losing many of their natural constituencies to the right. Um, you know, but when, when you look at the states where when you look at the states where that's happening, you know, what are um, Republican politicians going to do? Are they going to try to, you know, win on the basis of their old arguments and their old you know, dying constituency or will they embrace something new? Ultimately, over time, if they want to win, they'll have to embrace those changes. The other thing, on, on one of your very last comments that you said that the, the Democratic Party, you think, have gone, have gone very uh, left. Um, so in, in, your, um, in your presentation, um, you, you basically build your whole presentation on the sort of the divide between the right and the left. And I was wondering that to what extent is it still a workable theoretical framework to try to, to, to place the political parties on this uh, ideological continuum with the right on the one end of the continuum and the left on the other? Because you also brought many examples from many policy fields that you can sell policy decisions um, as right-wing or left-wing policy decisions regardless of the content of the political decision. So what is basically important is the narrative. If you are a Republican politician, you will say that this is a conservative policy. If you are a Democrat, uh, then you will say that this is a left thing-ish. Uh, and, um, and, and yeah, so the, the reason why I decided to, to ask this question is because you said that the Democratic Party is, is very left thing, but for example, in Europe, I don't think that the Democratic Party would even be considered to be a left-wing party. Maybe a liberal party, but definitely not a left-wing party. Or the other thing is that, that, that the Obama care was often portrayed as a socialist move. And even in Europe, even the most conservative politicians with a sound mind who would want to win the elections would never try to advocate the abolition of of uh, universal uh, health care and so on and so forth. So, so my question is to, to make this um, longer question short. To what extent do you think that it's still a workable theoretical framework to think in this left wing continuum? Or is it most not like the case that, that it's really just a patchwork of different political decisions? And what is important is how the politicians sell it to the voters as Republican or, or Democratic but political decisions or, or it's still a legitimate um, framework? Yeah, I mean, I think the ideas, uh, I think, um, I think the 
confusion typically comes because people think of left and right as issue sets, sets of issues, um, whereas I view them as just descriptions of um, political agency or something. Um, you know, obviously the, the terminology comes from the post-French Revolution era, um, and all throughout that period, you know, particular people and particular positions, you know, might have wound up on basically the left or right, depending on what the, you know, status of political movement was. But I think in a, in a, in, in a broad way, though, um, you know, left is what is, you know, pushing for a, you know, political change and right is what is, you know, defending against it. And that, you know, in the post-1789 world, you know, there's a, you know, broad and fairly typical set of, you know, ways or set of things that fall on the left, maybe um, kind of broadly the ideals of, you know, liberation and equality or something like that. Um, but, you know, I, so I think that conservatives for, you know, the last 200 or something years have thought of themselves as always being on the defense and the left is that party, which has thought of itself as being on the offense. And so that's what I mean when I say them, um, is that, you know, left is like, you know, the agent force, which is you know, seeking a change or, or upending of the present situation in a certain direction. Um, and right is more, more defensive. Um, so it's certainly not, it's, it's not a, yeah, it's not completely adequate, but I still think it's essential for understanding, um, like political dynamics or something like that. that would, maybe not for anal, maybe not for, I don't think you can take it. I don't think every issue is susceptible to being placed on the left or right. Um, like uh, the state, you know, what is in, in the U S maybe, um, maybe criticism of the state is on the right because um, when the progressives sought to, um, you know, transform much of American society in the early 20th century, their agent force was the state, but that wouldn't, translate well in large parts of this continent. You know? um, so I think it, 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 it's imperfect, but for me, it's just about political dynamics. Um, so. no, it makes sense. It's just that I think that for a, European, a general European audience, if you say right, left, they probably first think about economic policy issues. And, and, but that is absolutely makes sense. But it's just that I had this impression that you know, the, the, the right and then the left thing, at least, or or at least it's more like a policy, um, economic policy issue. My question is a little bit related to what you last said about what is the state and how it is viewed. And I was wondering whether this pushback against big tech actually should be viewed as something that brings the new right closer to the new left, or we can also view it through the logic of this conservative stance against interventionism. Because now we have these big tech companies that actually infringe on liberties like privacy or censorship, which were when rights were conceived, as we have them today, viewed as something that we should protect against the state. But today, right. the big tech com companies do that. So can it be that actually this pushback is again through the same logic of the old right as well and old conservatism? rather than through the logic of the old left. Yeah, but I, I think that it frustrates the old right. It's a little bit harder to fit into the old right, I guess. Um, you know, the um, there's a strong, there's always been a strong libertarian element of the tech world. Um, and that, you know, and a kind of libertarian interest in privacy um, but, you know, at least as libertarianism developed in the United States, it, you know, it, it doesn't have much of a language to talk about, you know, regulation on a national scale. So that's what I mean, that it's kind of a, 
maybe it's a sort of stumbling block within libertarian old right ways of thinking. Um, so there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of, you know, voices that, um, yeah, do seek to limit big tech through regulations that are oriented around preserving privacy. But that I think is a slightly different set of tools from the anti-monopoly tradition. Um, certainly it feels that all of those, it feels that the different, um, it feels that several different traditions are converging, right? You know, like um, I was just talking about like the, the standard conservative American voter, um, you know, who doesn't like the cultural messaging of Facebook that they're likely to encounter. It's not promoting the traditional family as they understand it, for example. Um, that's one, maybe that's one, I think that's like the new segment. Like the libertarian concerns have always been there, um, but they, at least in the U.S., they haven't had that much um, consequence, right? I mean, like our data protection laws are a joke. <laughs> you can buy and sell every kind of personal information in the in the U.S. market super easily, and that, by the way, affects our politics quite a lot. I mean, it affects political campaigning. I mean, it's much easier to just buy information on, buy a massive list, you know, data set of information about voters, and then maybe you know more about them. You become like an advertiser. You know more about them than they know about themselves. And you know to deliver them that they're most susceptible to political messaging at 9 p.m. on Tuesdays. So you make sure that the... I'm like exaggerating a little bit, um, but uh, you know, like data protection, that sort of privacy in the U S is a real uphill climb. Um, but yeah, you have a little, the anti-monopoly, you have the anti-monopoly tradition, you have the libertarian kind of techie people who are interested in privacy and entrepreneurship. They don't have a great language for like national regulation. Um, and then you have this sort of reactionary, um, you know, populist conservatism that at the moment is inchoate. It doesn't have a, it hasn't figured out what its tool is. Maybe it will end up in favor of, you know, breaking up the giants. Maybe it will end up in favor of um, some other way of regulating big tech. I don't know. It's tough because it's like the only industry America has now. So, um, um. Oh yeah. Hi, thank you so much Hi. for your um, speech today. I so I'm an American. I'm here studying in I'm in Hungary currently, but I've been around Europe a bit. So um, anyway, talking about the U.S., I think it's interesting because I grew up in a very conservative in Southern Indiana, okay. just super super conservative, very libertarian as well. Right. Um, and so I think. For me personally, it's kind of confusing when I see these discussions about social media and more specifically Facebook or Meta, whatever. <laughs> Meta. Um, because I definitely, when I was growing up, heard a lot of the conversations about government shouldn't regulate, the market will sort it out, just don't worry about it, and things will sort themselves out. And obviously, like you, the, the, Facebook has now been criticized a lot for promoting and citing, using its algorithms to promote what, what happened on January 6th, essentially. Right. Um, so I think it's interesting that it's being criticized, rightfully so, I would say, for promoting these kind of yeah. insurrection or violence against other individuals. And at the same time, at least the people that I know, I don't want to say this is 100% true, but the same people are the ones who are arguing against Facebook saying, okay, now Facebook's controlling us right, right, right. too much. So do you have anything to say? I can't formulate a proper question. No, I, no, I see it. I see the same phenomenon. Exactly. Um, yeah. I mean, if you, if we rewind to America 14 months ago, you know, September of September of 2020, um, you know, I remember waking up one morning, I was listening to NPR and it was just national public radio. 
And the storyline on NPR was, um, will Facebook do enough to stop the dangerous rise in hate speech between now and the election? Like, will they step up to the plate? You know, every and and this was this was being kind of pushed right every day. And then you like step into the conservative media landscape and it's the exact opposite, right? It's like, um, so how does that actually, you know, how does that actually work out from the user stand, user standpoint, I guess? Um, if we w- wind back a little bit further, eight or 10 years ago, I remember uh, the Wall Street Journal had uh, a thing on its website where you could view uh, blue Facebook or red Facebook corresponding to if Facebook thinks you're a Democrat or if Facebook thinks you're a Republican, right? And at that time, this, this problem that that was pointing to uh, was called siloing or something like that or cocooning or whatever. I, some of the forgot all my English words, but um, <laughs> you know, if Facebook identified you as a Democrat, it would, it would feed you a story about, um, you know, sometime like a, a gun violence, right? And if Facebook identified you as a Republican, it would feed you a story, heroic gun owner stops, you know, um, mass shooting, something like that. Um, I think that the typical like, conservative user of, of Facebook and Twitter now feels that it, they're no longer being catered to, right? That, that in fact, there's really only one algorithm, so to speak, and that it's designed to, you know, keep you hooked to reading it, but to, um, you know, whatever. It doesn't show you any, didn't show you any like pro-Trump content on the feed. At the same time, um, you know, it's the messaging services, it's, you know, 4chan, um, uh, Reddit, and, and the other kind of elements of the Internet Wild West, where, um, and maybe some Facebook groups before Facebook started removing them, um, where you got the kind of uh, feeding frenzy of conspiracy theories. So somehow both of these things are true. Like, you know, Alex Jones wouldn't exist if it weren't for the Internet and you know, but, uh, you know, he was banned from most of the major platforms a couple of years ago. So he has like an alternative platform. So anyone can go on there and, you know, get radicalized and, you know, find out about like where to meet on January 6th or whatever. But then since you're also, since you're also using the mainstream platform, maybe it even heightens the difference, right? It's like the polar, like the, somehow they're both true. (laughs) Like there's polarization, and because of that, you feel manipulated, you know, when you're looking at the other one, right? Because, like, you can, you, can, you can now totally immerse yourself in um, far-right conspiracy theory media if you want. You can just get all the podcasts, you know, just immerse yourself in that. Um, and then, you know, you can step, you step out of it and watch um, a football game, and suddenly the commercials, like, feel like you're being manipulated or something. I think that's, I think that's the experience that people are having. So somehow is somehow it's both true, but like in different ways, but um, that was too long of an answer, but I definitely um, sense the same thing. It's just, it's, I get the feeling that it's as I try to consume all political media, you know, <laughs> um, and try to like figure out what's get the feel of what's going on out there. Um, and it feels more like you have like a self-contained media world, you know, and like the parts of the right that led to, you know, January 6th, like that's, that's people living in a complete media cocoon. Uh, and the more that you're in the cocoon, you know, when you step out of it, it doesn't feel like, you know, you're not stepping back out into the objective New York times, you know, <laughs> you're stepping back out into something that feels very alien. So, yeah. And maybe at in the back row. Yeah. Thank you. So thank you for your talk and, and comments. And 
lastly, Clary, the last symbol is here in Budapest, and he gave an alarming talk. Not the first time, but last week as well, about now how the how internet basically very badly damaging democracy, public discourse. And uh, so I was just wondering what how do you think the this uh, the the processes you described this interesting shifts in the uh, Republican and Democratic Party's moves uh, are influenced by by this and and whether whether the damaging effect of, of, of the internet for the democratic discourse uh, can can somehow still allow uh, the formation of public opinion according to what people sort of think and discuss or if it is distorted so much that that's a big crisis itself. Yeah, and if the microphone yeah, didn't pick it up, yeah, the, the question is whether, um, you know, democracy is so distorted by, you know, technology and the internet that there's, that we have to take the black pill, you know, and it can't be um, sort of recovered. Um, well, you know, that's a, that's a difficult question. It, and, um, you know, to me, it does seem that the, um, I'm partly just going to re return to something I said a couple of minutes ago. Um, the data-driven campaigning, I think, is as much of a threat to democratic, democratic processes um, as like the decline in public discourse itself. Um, in again, in America, how that plays out is. Um, that it's easy to micro target people, you know, it's, you don't have to um, kind of stand in the forum and make a speech, you know, you can send everyone a like precisely, super precisely targeted message, um, you know, and, and I think at least, at least that's an, an overlooked element um, of the decline of discourse. Um, and it affect, affects it in a couple of ways. Um, you know, if you can if you can precisely target people with advertising, uh, then you know the the words that you say on the on the podium or in the public square are less important. In fact, it it may be better in the public square just to be sort of generally angry, you know, um, or voluble or um, you know, Trumpy, and then uh, let the let the micro targeting kind of explain, like hit people with messages that are known to be appealing to them. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think all of these things together are are bad for um, you know democratic decision making. But at the same time, um, you know, people know how much money they have in their bank account. <laughs> And, uh, you know, they can still sort through a lot of noise because of that. It's not an answer, it's just another consideration, though. Uh, thank you very much. I seriously don't want to torture you <laughs> any, any, any further. And, and I think that uh, the big conversation we didn't have was about the content of the positive message. Uh, and especially the positive culture of values and, and family values, because that's definitely a, a larger back to, to, to open and, and sit through. I, I really do want to thank everyone who joined us online in person. We have a small reception for the people who are physically here, and I do hope that, we, that, that this was not the last time that we, we had you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.